Hi, I'm Ian Porlupi, and welcome back to the Northland Workshop. Today is finally the long-awaited second part of the two-part video series on choosing a radial arm saw blade. In the first video, I talked about automating the cross-cut function of this saw, so that way it would take me out of the equation to test the blades for cross-cutting. But the more I thought about that, the less I liked that idea. For the simple fact that the automated setup wouldn't tell me if these blades were trying to self-feed. What I mean by that is rail arm saws have a reputation, whether it's deserved or not, you can be the judge of that, but they have a reputation of trying to propel themselves through the cut when you're cross-cutting, and it has to do with the rotation direction of the blade and as you pull it through the cut, depending on the blade, it could try to pull itself through the piece of wood, and that's rather unnerving. You have to kind of hold the saw carriage back. If I automated that test, yes, they would all cross cut at exactly the same speed. It would be uniform, something that I can't do because I'm not a robot, but it would not tell me if the thing's trying to walk itself across the workpiece. And half the battle with the saw blade is how does it feel to use the thing? Because it could give the best cut in the world, but if it's unnerving to use the thing because it's trying to propel itself along, or with a ripping blade it's trying to kick back at you every five seconds, is it worth using a blade that gives a good cut, but you're scared to death to use it? No, probably not. So I decided to get rid of the automated portion and I cross cut like I usually do. I tried to give the blades the benefit of the doubt. If anything, I erred on the side of cross cutting a little slower than normal, again, to get the best cut possible. One thing you will notice is I use the old table that's on this rail arm saw. This table is pushing 13, 14 years old now at this point. It's worn. It is not zero clearance, but just about any blade will give you a clean cut with a zero clearance table. Fresh table on it supports the fibers underneath. You're going to get a clean cut. That's more a test of the table than the blade. So I didn't feel bad about this table having a wide kerf in it because if anything this shows what the blades are capable of doing more so than the table. If a blade geometry or blade sharpness requires you to use a zero clearance table to get acceptable cross cuts, that blade should come with an auxiliary table to put on the saw. Otherwise, you're making up for deficiency in the blade, in my opinion. Speaking of my opinion, these results, we're going to look at them on the camera, and I hope that you can see the difference between cuts and stuff like that, and I'll talk about how it felt to use this blade and my experience using this blade for the tests, but Understand, this is my opinion, and what I look for in a blade and what you look for in a blade could be totally different. The rest of the video is going to be me actually making test cuts with these blades, and then we're going to look at the results, and I'm going to talk about my experience with the blade while it was cutting. But let's say you don't have time to watch all that. You just want to know what blade you buy for your rail arm saw. Well, it's more complicated than that because... What you do with your rail arm saw could be different than what I use it for. You could be using a species of wood that I've never tried on the rail arm saw, so your results may vary. But I'm going to try and break it down by category of blade and category of user. Let's start off with you've never used a rail arm saw before. You just bought one, you've got it all fixed up, and you want to know what is the first blade to buy for it. Or, you're in the category of, this is the saw 
in my workshop. I'm going to use it for everything. There's no space for a table saw. This does everything. If you're in those two categories, my recommendation is a combination blade of this geometry. It doesn't have to be a Freud blade like this one. Any good name of combination blade will do it. But my recommendation is this tooth setup right here. The groups of five separated by a big gullet with four of the teeth having the alternate top bevel followed by a raker tooth. That, in these tests, show it has the best ability to make good cuts across the grain and with the grain so it can cross cut and rip to an acceptable degree. It is not as good at cross-cutting as, say, a dedicated cross-cutting blade. And it's not as good at ripping as a dedicated ripping blade. This shouldn't come as a surprise because those are two very different operations with the wood. And it requires very different teeth design. So the fact that this can do a good job at both of them is a good thing. But the dedicated blades do their specific task better than this one. This does it good enough that for 80% of the stuff you're going to do, this is great. I tested three combination blades with different tooth geometries and this style with the groups of five and the big gullets was the only one that made acceptable cross cuts, acceptable rip cuts, and acceptable panel raising cuts, which is really a rip cut on steroids. It's a very deep rip cut. The other two combination blades, one made acceptable cross cuts. It actually made cross cuts cleaner than this. That blade I'm talking about is the Woodworker One triple chip grind, not the alternate top bevel. I have to specify because there's two Woodworker One blades floating around out there. That one made slightly cleaner cross cuts than this blade did. However, it really did not like ripping and it did not like raising the panel. It just kind of burned its way through both of those things. So, I don't consider that a good combination blade because it only did one of its operations that it was supposed to do acceptably and it still didn't do that task to the level that a dedicated crosscut blade could do. The other combination blade was the Amana 40 tooth combination blade. It had the opposite issue. It did a very good job ripping and a very good job raising the panel but it was horrible for cross-cutting. Way too much tear out. Not acceptable. Okay, maybe it's a ripping blade. No, it's not. It didn't rip as well as the dedicated rip blade. So, if you're looking for a combination blade, again, don't get wrapped up on the brand. This is just what I happened to find that was a size that would fit my saw. The key you're looking for is this geometry of combination blade. Maybe in your shop you have decided that the rail arm saw is only going to cross cut things. And when I say cross cut, I also mean miter. Anything that ends up going across the grain, not ripping. So strict no ripping policy in your shop on the rail arm saw. Just cross the grain. If that's the case, I don't recommend a combination blade. Why? Because a combination blade, some of the teeth are designed with ripping in mind and some are designed with cross cutting in mind, which means the whole blade isn't set up for cross cutting. And as these tests show, the cut quality suffers. Yes, the combination blade will do an adequate job cross cutting but it's not nearly as good cross-cutting as a dedicated cross-cut blade. So if that's all you're going to do with the saw, 
it would be foolish to sacrifice cut quality with a blade that is designed to do an operation that you're never going to use it for. In that case, if you're only going to cross cut with your rail arm saw, or you do everything with your rail arm saw, but you've got a project coming up where it's just going to be cross cuts as far as the eye can see. You've got a whole bunch of stuff stacked up, you're going to cross cut all of it, and you want the best cut quality possible, my recommendation is a dedicated cross cut blade. Get as high a tooth count as you can and it'll usually be billed as ultimate cross cut, ultra cross cut, whatever brand you like, it's going to be billed as the cross cut blade to end all cross cut blades. That is the blade you want for your saw. It is going to give you the cleanest cross cut possible. I try out two of them here. One of them is a premium cross cut blade from Freud because again they made the blades that fit the saw that I could find easy enough. And I found one that was super super cheap on Amazon. I'd have to go back and look at the first video to see what I paid for this. I don't remember but I believe it was less than $50, which is ridiculously cheap for a 14 inch diameter saw blade with 120 carbide teeth on it. That's just a ridiculous price. For that price, I wasn't sure what I was actually going to get in the mail, if it was going to have all its teeth on it or not, or if it was going to launch some of these teeth into a low earth orbit the first time I turned it on. But I have to say, I am thoroughly, thoroughly impressed by the cut qualities of this thing. This cheap cross-cut blade beats the pants off the premium combination blade in terms of cut quality for cross-cutting. Why? Because every tooth on this blade is designed to cut across the grain. So, blade geometry and blade design is more important than the price of the blade. Now, what is the longevity of a super cheap blade like this? I don't know. I don't know what quality the carbide teeth are on this thing. They might not hold an edge very long. It's definitely not a blade that I would send out to get resharpened. I don't even know if these teeth have enough thickness to them to be resharpened. But at this price, I can buy five of these things for the price of one premium cross-cut blade. And as we see in the test, this blade and the premium blade, it's only a tiny difference in cut quality between the two. So, what I mean by this is, if you're using a combination blade because you're using your saw for everything, Consider getting a cheap cross-cut blade to hang on the wall and use it when you have a lot of cross-cutting to do. Or if you're cutting molding or something like that where you really can't tolerate any tear out, a cheap cross-cut blade will give you a better cut than a premium combination blade. Let's say you either have a lot of ripping to do on the radial arm saw, you have to rip very thick things on the radial arm saw like 4x4 posts or 2x4s, or you want to raise panels on the radial arm saw. If you're in that group, I recommend, wait for it, wait for it, a dedicated ripping blade. As we will see in these tests, Using a ripping blade on the radial arm saw does not automatically wipe out the entire neighborhood. And not only did I not die using this ripping blade and the 30 tooth ripping blade in these tests, both of these ripping blades gave a better cut and cut faster than the combination blade, which again should not come as a surprise but it tends to that a dedicated blade 
works better in its intended role than a combination blade. So don't just take my word for it. Let's go ahead and actually make the test cuts with these blades and see what they're capable of. Here's the auxiliary table that I made years ago for my ray alarm saw that allows me to raise panels easily on this thing. It's set up along with the 24 tooth ripping blade because this is the reason I bought this blade in the first place, this application right here. If we look at this, it looks strangely like a table saw that's been flipped over on its side. This is essentially the table saw table and this is the table saw fence. The blade sticks through the table and when it rotates it tries to pull the wood tight up against the table just like a table saw. It's also trying to push the wood back at you as you feed it in just like a table saw. So the laws of physics on this setup are the same as a table saw. Even though these are big aggressive teeth, as they bite into the wood, they apply more and more force up against this fence to keep the workpiece up against it. It's not trying to lift it up like the radial arm saw does in normal ripping. So you don't get that fluttering chatter effect that is kind of unnerving. Let's go ahead and raise a panel with the 24 tooth blade. So if we take a look, that cut is very, very smooth and there is no burning anywhere along there. Here we have the 30 tooth ripping blade. And as we saw in the first video, this has the little anti-kickback ears on it to limit how big of a bite it can take at a time. That was something that the 24 tooth blade didn't have. And you'll also notice that the gullets are slightly smaller because they are more teeth, the diameter of the blade is the same, so the spacing between the teeth went down a little bit. Plus, some of the gullet space is taken up by these little anti-kickback ears. Let's go ahead and raise the back side of this panel with this and see how it compares to the 24 tooth ripping blade. The 30 tooth blade made a very smooth cut. I would say that this surface finish is actually nicer than the 24 tooth blade, which makes sense because it's a finer tooth blade. However, you will notice some burning. Now, I'm not going to blame this on the blade. I'm blaming this on this piece of wood. This is an old salvage piece of wood and it rocks slightly on this side. And I noticed it rocked on the table at the same time it was burning. So I'm not blaming that on the blade. I'm blaming that on this less than ideal piece of wood. But like I explained in the beginning of the video, I'm essentially wasting a whole bunch of wood testing these blades. So I'm not going to put real nice wood into this test because nothing's really coming out of it other than sawdust and little scrap pieces of wood. So yes, this piece rocks. I'm convinced if it wasn't rocking like this, if it was a real panel that was flat, it would not have done this. So. The surface finish was nice. I couldn't tell a difference in speed feeding this thing through the 30 tooth versus the 24 tooth. So I would say the 30 tooth actually did a better job because just feeling it, this is smoother than the 24 tooth on this side. This is still pretty smooth. 
The other one is just a little bit smoother. It's time to see how the 40 tooth mana blade does raising a panel. As you can see, very nice job with the panel raising. The surface feels a little rougher than the 30 tooth or the 24 tooth ripping blade. That could be the blade, that could be, even though this is the same piece of wood, it's a different section in the piece of wood. I don't know what's up with that. Looks wise, looks the same, no burning. Had to push it a little harder to get it to cut in a fast manner, but not a big deal. Overall, I would say that this looks like it is a good blade to raise panels with. This is my 70 tooth combination blade. This is what for years I've been using on my rail arm saw to raise panels because I use it on my rail arm saw to do everything. Well, that blade is over 10 years old. So I thought in the spirit of fairness because all these other blades are virtually brand new and I say virtually because I use the Woodworker 1 for a handful of cuts before it went back in its box but the rest of them are brand new. So, I went ahead and purchased a new 70 tooth combination blade. It's the exact same blade. The only difference is this has the red coating that's supposed to prevent pitch buildup, whereas this one does not have the red coating. Other than that, tooth geometry is exactly the same it's the same blade, they just didn't have any of the red ones in stock. So we're going to try it with the new version of this 10 year old blade. So let's take a look at this cut. First thing, which would not show up on camera, is I had to push harder to get this thing to cut at a reasonable speed. It was a slow cut. Slower than any of the other ones. Which I was expecting because that's how the red blade always behaves. The other thing is, if we look down here, there's a little burn mark here. Now this is a scrap piece of wood again, and it rocks a little bit. So I am blaming that burn mark right there on the fact that it probably rocked a little bit as I was pushing it through, and it simply came up off the table a little bit and rubbed on the underside of the teeth. So that, I'm not blaming on the blade. When we come down here, and I don't know how well this is going to show up on camera, so I'll try it from a couple different angles to see if you can see it, but from right about here to right about here, there's a dark patch, and I can see the curve of the blade in it. I can't feel it, but I can see it where it got hot right there, and I could smell hot wood during this cut. So it was definitely working at it, and it was not as pleasant a panel raising experience as either the 40 tooth Amana, the 30 tooth ripping blade, or the 24 tooth ripping blade. It did it. Cut quality wise, in terms of smoothness, is good. The burning here could sand out pretty easily. If this was a piece of cherry, however, that whole thing would have been scorched and I would spend the rest of the day sanding it. So, does it work? Yes. Does it work as well as the other blades for this? No. I'm going to raise a panel with the Forest Woodworker 1 because if you have one of these blades, you might be interested in how well it'll raise a panel. 
For me personally, I would not use this blade to raise a panel simply because it doesn't leave a flat bottom to the kerf or even an approximate flat bottom. The issue is the teeth with the triple chip grind where they have the little corners knocked off. The center part of the tombstone shape hangs down below the raker teeth. So instead of what a combination blade does with the alternate top bevel, it kind of undercuts the corners a little bit and you're left with a tiny little V in the corner. Here you're left with a little chamfer in the corner of the kerf, which to me doesn't look good down in the bottom of the field of the raised panel and I'll show you that in a minute when we cut it. That's just my own personal taste. Other than that, this should have no problem raising a panel because it is designed to be a do-everything universal blade. Let's give it a shot and see what it does. I have a hard time believing that this blade cuts this badly that it's responsible for all this burning. I think it's the fact that this thing rocks a little bit and it was able to rock during the cut and press up on the bottom of the blade. So what I'm going to do is give this thing the benefit of the doubt and I've got another piece of wood here. Now this piece of wood, what I did is I glued a shim under this corner so it does not rock at all. So we can eliminate the possibility of the workpiece rocking a little bit. So let's see what this does with this non-rocking piece of wood. You probably noticed, like I did during the cut, that it didn't cut all the way up to the surface here. Well, evidently, this piece of wood is slightly thicker than the other piece of wood, but that really doesn't matter because we're not really raising a panel. We want to check the cut surface. If we look at the cutoff piece, that looks pretty good. Little bit of tooth marks in here, but really not bad. That could all be sanded out very easily. This side, however, it's not bad, but it does have some burning here. Burning here, light burning, basically light burning from here all the way to here and then a little bit on the end. This thing is dead steady on this table. It doesn't rock at all. I can't contribute any of that burning to this workpiece moving at all and hitting the bottom of the blade. This burning, I have to contribute to the blade because I don't have any other choice. I've ruled out everything else. Is this an acceptable raised panel? Yes and no. For pine, something like that, this would be no problem. You could sand this very light burning off with 220 grit sandpaper and call it a day. If this was a piece of cherry and it did this, it wouldn't just look like this. It would just be scorched. You would wreck your raised panel if it was cherry and you did it with this blade. So, one thing to keep in mind. Do I recommend this blade for raising panels? No, because even under the best circumstances, 
it leaves behind a lot of burning. As far as panel raising is concerned, I've arranged these blades in the order from best to worst. And this is kind of a tough decision right here between the 24 tooth and the 30 tooth ripping blade. They virtually did an identical job to one another, so it's hard to pick a winner between these. The only reason why I'm going with the 24 tooth as the winner for I've arranged the five blades that we used for raising a panel in order from my most recommended to the one I don't recommend at all. The reason I chose the 24 tooth ripping blade is I know for a fact this doesn't produce burn marks on cherry. I've actually ripped some or raised some cherry panels with this and it does a fine job, so I know this can do it. I wouldn't have an issue raising panels with the 30 tooth one either, and I would choose either the 24 tooth or the 30 tooth over the three combination blades any day. They just do a better job, there was no burning whatsoever, and it just does a better job. The reason for that once again, is this is what comes out of the blade when you're raising a panel. It's very stringy, long, fibery dust. It's not really dust, it's almost like planar shavings. And you need big gullets to be able to capture this stuff and then throw it out the back of the panel raising table. Which is why I think this 40 tooth combination blade from Amana does a better job raising panels than either the 70 tooth Freud or the Forest Woodworker 1 triple chip grind blade. Out of the combination blades, if I couldn't have a dedicated ripping blade to raise panels, the Amana would be my preference. It had the least amount of burning out of these, followed by the Freud, and then this one just scorched its way through. Even with the second test, to give it the benefit of the doubt, it still left an unreasonable amount of burning on the piece of wood. And I don't know about you, but I really don't like sanding that much, so I wouldn't choose to use this blade for raising a panel. I'm not going to try ripping the three-quarter inch thick pine with the 24 tooth ripping blade. It's just too coarse of a blade. However, I am going to rip the 2x4 with it because this blade says it's good for inch and a half to three and a half inch. So I'm going to rip it with this. After I get done ripping with this, we're going to take a look at it ripping a three and a half inch thick piece of Douglas fir. Let's take a look at the cut we got from the 24 tooth ripping blade. If we look, it's a beautiful cut. There's no burning whatsoever. There was no resistance to me pushing this thing through, which I wouldn't expect there to be any resistance because this is on the thin side of what this blade can cut. So it had no problem whatsoever getting the chips out of the kerf. And it was, a pleasure to rip this 2x4 with this 24 tooth blade. There's a couple tooth marks in this thing where it, you can see it was cut with a circular blade. 
I would expect that. This isn't a glue line rip blade. This is just a get it over with fast type blade. So few teeth, tends to make more marks on the side, but to me, a couple shallow tooth marks in here is still a lot better than it burning its way through the workpiece. They're easy to sand out or hit it with a hand plane, but if you get the deep burn marks, especially in something like cherry, that's a real pain in the butt to try and get rid of that. Plus, then the workshop starts to smell like smoke, and that's no fun. I don't have any more 4x4 posts to rip with this thing, so if you bear with me, we're going to reuse the footage from when I built the anti-kickback paws and I tested them out with the 24 tooth blade ripping a 4x4 post. Unfortunately, I don't have any more 4x4 posts to rip with this thing for this test specifically, but like you saw me do just a second ago when I was making the anti-kickback Paul video, I ripped this 4x4 post and I kept the offcut of it so we could take a look at it in this video. If you look, there are teeth marks all along the top. That doesn't surprise me. This 4x4 post, like most 4x4 posts, was not super flat, so it did rock back and forth a little bit, and I think that's why this top edge got chewed up the way it did. I can't really fault the blade for that. That's the wood I was using. What I do like is the fact that I was able to push the 4x4 post through fast enough that I didn't get burning. There's no burning on this thing. It was a nice cut, a little rough, but that's a very coarse blade. I expect a rougher cut from a coarse blade. And it's not billed as a glue line rip blade or anything like that. This is a high speed excavate wood, don't look back type blade. You did notice on that video that the 4x4 chattered a little bit. It tried to pick up off the table a little bit. I expect that. This is a blade without any of the little anti-kickback ears to limit the depth of cut, so it's going to try and take as much wood as it possibly can. The bigger bite it takes, the more it tries to pick the workpiece up off the table. Is it a little unnerving when the workpiece kind of flutters up above the table? Yes, but it's not surprising. And as long as the front edge of the guard is down within an eighth of an inch of the top of this, ideally as close as you can get it to the top of the workpiece, there's really not much the fluttering can do. It's just going to kind of do it. As you see, I lived through cutting the three and a half inch thick piece of wood with the 24 tooth ripping blade, and I lived through cutting the two by four with the 24 tooth ripping blade. So it is a good blade for ripping wood on the rail arm saw. I've got the 30 tooth blade in the rail arm saw, and I'm going to rip the three quarter inch thick piece of pine with it. Three quarters of an inch is as thin as I would want to go and use this blade. The reason for that is three quarters of an inch, you still have 
three teeth engaged in the cut, which is the general rule of thumb for any kind of saw blade. But it just barely has three teeth in it. So this is as thin as I would want to go with it. Thicker wood, of course, you're going to have more teeth engaged in the cut. And like I talked about in the first video, you want enough teeth engaged in the cut that it doesn't take too big of a bite and start lifting the thing, but not so many teeth that the saw doesn't have the power to back that cut up and the blade speed drops too low. So really, for me personally, a 30 tooth blade, at least on this saw, would be better served for ripping 2x4s and stuff like that. But it will also do down to 3 quarters of an inch in my opinion, so that's what I'm going to try it with first. Later, we can try it with a 2x4. So if we take a look, you'll see no burning on this side of the cut, and if I reach around the camera for a second, no burning on this side of the cut. Nice smooth cut. Also, if you noticed, the board didn't lift off the table at all. There was no chattering. It wasn't coming up and hitting the guard. It stayed put. Now the reason it stayed put, even with a 30 tooth blade, is the little anti-kickback teeth. They limit how much of a bite the thing can take and they also keep the workpiece from riding up because in order to ride up it would have to engage more and more of the teeth but it can't do that because these little ears limit it. So the ears also keep it down. That was a very nice ripping experience on this thing because I was able to push it through at a very fast speed which again reduces burning. It also picks up productivity which again not a production shop don't really care about that but no burning. That's the big thing because anytime there's burning depending on how deep the burn mark is it's going to involve planing or jointing or just a whole lot of sanding to remove that thing. So I am very impressed with that cut and I like the way that thing operates. I like the way it operates in the panel raising mode and I like the way I see it ripping right now. Let's go ahead and rip a 2x4 with it and see how it does with the 2x4. Now if we take a look at this cut, extremely smooth, no burning, and I was able to push it through just as fast as I wanted to, and if you noticed, there was no lifting or chattering on the table. Very nice ripping by this blade. I am really impressed with the 30 tooth blade. Here we have the strange looking Amana 40 tooth combination blade. This has the alternate top bevel teeth and the flat top raker tooth as well. But it's got a very strange tooth geometry. So let's see what it does. It has big gullets so it should be good at ripping.
we take a look at this cut, you'll see pretty good cut, little bit of burning here, not bad, but I could feel that it was a slower cut. As I tried to push it the same speed as the 30 tooth one, it just wasn't having it. Not a huge deal, but just something to be aware of. That tells me that ripping is not this thing's forte, which makes sense because it has a pretty unaggressive hook angle to it. So, not a very aggressive blade. It showed that it wasn't super aggressive. Again, a little bit of burning, not bad. That could be this 2x4. It looks like it's straight on both edges, but you never know. It could have tried to twist a little bit because I notice it doesn't have it on here. And I know this piece came out of it this way because it's got the lumber stamp on it. So it doesn't have a matching burn mark here, so it could be that it was pushing away from the fence a little bit. It didn't shatter at all. It didn't try to come off the table, so it's a very well-behaved blade. Not intimidating for ripping, so that's good. Let's go ahead and try it with some three-quarter inch pine and see what it does there. So if we take a look at the cut, both sides, it is a very nice cut. I was able to pick up the travel speed versus the 2x4, which makes sense because it was having to remove less wood. Overall, I would say the ripping ability of this combination blade is good. It's definitely not a dedicated rip blade, but it's not supposed to be a dedicated rip blade. But it's very good. It doesn't chatter, doesn't try to lift off the table. And other than the little bit of burning on the 2x4, which again could be just internal stress of the 2x4, seems pretty good. There was no burning, no teeth marks on the 3 quarter inch pine. Let's try ripping a 3 quarter inch thick piece of wood with the 70 tooth combination blade. That worked great. If you take a look, no burning on either side of the cut. It didn't try to lift off the table at all. There was no chattering. And I didn't feel like the blade was holding me back any when I was ripping. Let's try ripping the 2x4. I would like to point out for a second that so far I've been doing everything in the out rip position, which means the blade is facing out away from the column. Normally for smaller stuff like this, I like to spin it around and do in ripping where the blade is on the side of the column and the motor is hanging out this way towards the camera. The issue with that is visibility for you guys. In order for you to see what's happening better, it's a whole lot easier if the motor is out of the way. So if you're wondering why I'm doing it this way, that's why, so that way you can see what's going on. With that said, let's rip a 2x4. If we take a look, the cut quality of this was excellent. It didn't burn the wood, went right through it. I will say that I found myself pushing this blade, or pushing the wood through the blade harder than the 30 tooth or the 40 tooth blade. So there is that, but it did a great job with the cut. Now I'm going to rip a 2x4 
with the Forest Woodworker 1 triple chip grind blade. from a ripping experience point of view this did very well because it didn't try to pick the wood up off the table that's good because it's unnerving when they do that it required more force than the ripping blade to cut this but again it's not a ripping blade it's a general purpose slash combination blade that's made to do everything even though on the box it actually doesn't talk about cutting solid wood at all. But, according to some people, this does. From a cut quality standpoint, now keep in mind, this saw is in the same position other than move back a little bit that it was when I used the 70 tooth combination blade. So, I didn't tweak it one way or the other so it's not out of parallel with the fence or anything like that because that hasn't changed all i did was swap blades and move it back about a quarter of an inch to make this cut this is the cut i was presented with i am willing to give a blade the benefit of the doubt with a little bit of burning especially around a knot like this where there's probably some tension and it moves a little bit when you cut it and it rubs up against the blade. But the burning starts up here and doesn't end until down here. The whole thing has burn marks on it. In my opinion, the Woodworker 1 triple chip grind blade is no good at ripping a 2x4. This is the same thing that I saw this particular blade do way back when I first got it, which is why I started buying up a whole bunch of saw blades. So this is what I've experienced with this blade with 2x4s. Let's try ripping some 3 quarter inch thick pine with the Forest Woodworker 1. Okay, first let's talk about the ripping experience with this blade. I had to push this piece of wood pretty hard to get the same type of travel speed I was getting out of the other blades, which is not a big surprise because there's a lot of teeth on this thing. So that's okay, it's not a production shop. However, when I smell burning wood throughout the whole cut, I start to wonder what I'm going to find. This is what I'm presented with with the Forest Woodworker 1. The burning starts here and it ends here, which coincides with the start and the end of the board. Although there is one section in here that's not bad. Actually, that's pretty good. And there's a little section here. Other than that, it's just burning. If this was a piece of cherry, it would really be ugly. I've now arranged the blades in the order of preference for ripping on the radial arm saw. And just like with raising a panel, the ripping portion of the findings is really a toss-up between these two. For this thing, I was able to rip three quarter inch wood and it stayed on the table. It wasn't so aggressive that it picked it up or anything like that. I would not try to rip three quarters of an inch thick wood 
with this blade. There's not enough teeth engaged in the workpiece. It's going to take a really big bite and either lift it off the table or try to throw it back at you. So this is for thick wood. In fact, it even says right on it, it's for inch and a half to three and a half inch thick wood. This is good at ripping three quarter inch thick wood. However, honestly, in the three quarter inch thick range, two of these combination blades are perfectly adequate at it. If I'm ripping three quarter inch thick wood with my saw, I'm probably going to leave on whichever combination blade I already had in the saw. I'm not going to turn to a dedicated ripping blade until it's inch and a half thick or more, which means one of these two and over three quarters of an inch, you start to get into this territory a bit more. So that's a toss up. I can't, I'm giving it to the three, the 30 tooth blade simply because it doesn't make the wood lift off the table and that's a little unnerving when it does that. So the 30 tooth blade to me is the winner for ripping. However, once you understand the 24 tooth blade and the fact that it's going to lift off the table a little bit, that's why you keep the edge of the guard down close to the workpiece. This is okay too, as long as it's thick. Again, you want to make sure you have three teeth in the piece of wood at all times. For thinner wood, which is common with woodworking, the Amana beats out the Freud by a little bit. And just like with raising the panel, I attribute this to the bigger gullets in here. Because just like raising the panel, ripping produces big curly cues of wood. And these little teeth in the combination blade just don't have enough space in between to adequately hold this until the tooth gets outside the cut. It's okay, it does it, but the Amana does it just a little bit better and I think it's because it's got more space for the sawdust to go. And then we have the Forest Woodworker 1. And just like raising the panel, this thing kind of burned itself through the wood. Is it the worst thing ever? No, maybe not, but I usually have my blade sharpened before they produce cuts that look like this. So the fact that this is brand new and it's also cutting worse than one I would send out to be sharpened, I'm going to say I don't recommend that for ripping. Can it physically rip? Yes, it can physically rip. Will it pick up the piece of wood and throw it across the shop? No. Will it make a clean cut? Clean, yes. Burn free, no. So, something to be aware of. I don't recommend this for ripping. This test is the dedicated crosscut blades and the combination blades because they're billed as a blade that can crosscut and rip, so they get tested twice. I've assembled some materials to test these blades with. One thing is cross-cutting the outer veneer side of birch veneer plywood. Birch veneer plywood, veneer, loves to chip out. So I think this will be a good test of how well these blades can sever the fibers. Because the better they can sever the fibers when cross-cutting, the less tear out we should see on the birch veneer plywood. So there's that. Friendly old pine. Now you'll notice at the end here, there is a knot and some bark inclusions here. I'm going to start the test way away from that because not every blade would come up against this and I don't think it would be fair to test one blade up against a knot and some bark, whereas the rest of it they all have just clean pine. So we're going to start away from that and just test in here. 
This should be an easy one. They should all be able to cross cut three quarter inch pine. I've got some Douglas fir. This is slightly under three quarters of an inch. Let me see what is it exactly. It is five eighths of an inch thick. This stuff is miserable to cross cut. It loves to splinter out on the bottom. So this should be a bit of a challenge for these things, kind of like the birch veneer plywood. So if they can do a good job with this, I will be impressed. Then I have some cherry and I've got two different pieces. I've got some three quarter inch cherry and I've got some one inch rough cut. Is that one inch? It is one inch. It is one inch rough cut cherry. So we will see how these do in terms of burning on the end, whether it's thicker or thinner, and then what the chip out looks like. On this one, we can't really judge the chip out because it's roughs on, mainly looking to see what the burning situation is. Here, we'll look at the burning, but I'm mostly concerned with what the cut quality is. First up in the crosscut test is the 120 tooth Concord blade. This was the super cheap one off Amazon and I'm really curious to see how this thing does just because it is so cheap. This is the underside of the piece of Douglas fir cut with the 120 tooth Concord blade. And if we look, very, very minimal tear out. That's a very clean cut. Here's the underside of the three quarter inch thick cherry. If we look, there's a tiny amount of tear out, but again, very, very minimal. This, if you were to hit the edge with a piece of 220 grit sandpaper, it would take care of that. The one inch thick cherry, it's hard to tell what the tear out is because the thing is rough sawn. But if we look, there's no burning on the end of this. So that's a good sign. It's not rubbing on anything. And I can feel ever so slight teeth marks right here. but. They happen to coincide with the growth ring, so I think that could be having something to do with it. But other than that, it's a very smooth cut, and big thing, no burn marks. Here's the underside of the birch veneer plywood cut, and if we look, there's some tear out. A couple strands right here go back about three sixteenths of an inch, but there's only two of them like that. The rest of them are all very close to the edge and very minimal. That, it would take a little bit of sanding to get rid of, but it's not horrible. Here we have the piece of pine. It's got very minimal tear out right in this area and just a little bit over here, but overall that's a very nice cut and that is something I would expect from a dedicated crosscut blade. In terms of cross-cutting experience, this was a excellent, excellent blade. It did not try to propel itself through the workpiece at all. I had to pull the saw carriage through. It was very well behaved. This is a very nice cross-cut blade. Here we have the 108 tooth alternate top bevel blade. Let's see what it does. Here we have the bottom of the piece of Douglas fir cut with the 108 tooth cross cut blade. And if we look, this thing, it's got some tear out, but it's minimal. It's really not that bad. 
it does look like it's more than the 120 tooth blade, but still very acceptable because if I brush it with my finger, I can take the fuzzy bits off and with a little bit of sanding, that goes away entirely. One place where this thing is better than the Concord blade, this thing is silky smooth. The Concord blade was very smooth, but this cut is smoother right here. So that's one thing to note. If I had to guess, this blade is a thicker blade than the Concord. The Concord is pretty thin. That means it can wobble a little bit, whereas this being thicker, it's inherently more stable. The downside to that is it takes more power because it's removing more wood, and the other downside is it's removing more wood, so that's something to be aware of. But it did leave a smoother cut. Again, the Concord was very smooth, but this is perfect right here. A little more tear out, but the end of it is perfect. Here we have the one inch thick cherry, and if we look, zero burning. Very clean cut all the way along. And again, very, very smooth. Here we have the three quarter inch thick cherry, and if we look right here along the bottom edge, it is virtually tear out free. I see a couple little things right there, but I am actively looking for them. Here we have the bottom of the birch veneer plywood. And if I look at this, there's a little bit of tear out right there, a little bit right there, and just a tiny bit right there. This is, but again, I'm really looking for it. It is teeny tiny, and if I brush the little fuzzies off, I would never notice the tear out. That's an excellent cut on the birch veneer plywood. And then we have the friendly old pine. If we look, a little bit of tear out here, a little bit here, and a little bit there. Not bad at all. So, this to me looks like less tear out than the Concord. And again, that's a perfectly smooth cut. Just like the Concord blade, this had zero tendency to try and feed itself through the workpiece. It let me pull it through at my own pace. So it was a very good cross-cutting experience with this blade. It's time to cross-cut with the Forest Woodworker 1 blade. One thing you will notice is there's a lot of pitch buildup on these teeth. I think that's a result of this thing basically rubbing its way through the cuts. When we did the ripping cut, it burned. When we did the panel raising, it burned. So there was definitely friction happening on the side of the teeth. And that has resulted in a lot of pitch buildup. Part of me thought I should wash this off first, but I've decided against it for the simple reason that this is built as a combination blade that can do both ripping and cross cutting. So the natural thing most people would do with that blade is go from cross cutting to ripping to cross cutting to ripping back and forth. If I have to take the blade off the saw to wash off the pitch buildup each time going from one operation to the other, I might as well have two separate blades that I swap in and out. So if I was using this blade in a project and I just ripped a couple things, and granted I only ripped and raised a couple cuts on that thing, two raised panel cuts and two rip cuts, and if I was really raising a panel, it would have been at least four raised panel cuts. So this was only a fraction of what it normally would do. So in a real project, this is what this thing would have on it apparently. So we're going to test it as is.
Here's the piece of one inch rough cut cherry cut with the Forest Woodworker one blade. I'm happy to say that for the first time in this test, we have been able to get this thing to cut without leaving burn marks on things. So right off the bat, I'm going to say this thing cross cuts way better than it rips. However, it definitely does not cross cut as nicely as one of the dedicated cross cutting blades. I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but along with the growth rings on here, it does have ridges. Now this thing is billed as giving a smooth polished cut. This is about what I would expect polishing something with 80 grit sandpaper. It's rough. It's rougher than the Concord blade and it's way rougher than the Freud 108 tooth blade. So is it bad? No. Is it what I was led to believe this blade could do? No. If we take a look at the cherry board, you can see a little bit of chip out here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and a little bit there. It is very, very minor. Very minor. So if you just run your finger over it and the fuzzies go away, that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. The edge is still not smooth. It's smooth in one direction, very cat tongue-like in the other. But in terms of tear out on the bottom of this cut, that's excellent. For the birch plywood, it has a small but consistent amount of tear out all the way along. Really, that's not too bad because just brushing off the fuzzy bits once again, it goes away unless I'm really looking for it. So I would say that's a good cross cut in birch plywood. Again, not super smooth on the edge, but tear out wise, excellent. Here we have the piece of pine. We've got tear out right about here. Fairly extensive right here. Some of it goes back to about there. It's not super deep, so it would sand out pretty well, but this looks like more tear out than the two dedicated crosscut blades have, which is to be expected because this is a general purpose blade, whereas the crosscut blades are true crosscut blades. Other than that, I would say this is pretty good. Okay, this one, however, I'm not impressed with. It is very fuzzy along this edge. This is the Douglas fir. And this Douglas fir is very old. It's a, almost 70 years old. So it's had 70 years of inside life, originally as flooring, to dry out. So it's very dry, it's brittle, and it likes to splinter. There's no doubt about that, but this splintering is way more than the crosscut blades. I would not accept this amount of splintering on a cut from a premium saw blade. If I brush it, the fuzzy bits go away. You can still see some of the deeper parts where it pulled fibers out. It's not horrible but it is the worst tear out in a cross cut I've seen so far. In terms of cross cutting experience, this thing was just as good as the Freud cross cut blade and the Concord cross cut blade. It didn't try to feed itself through the workpiece, let me pull it through. From that standpoint, it was an excellent cross cut blade. Here we have the 70 tooth Freud combination blade. Just like with the forest blade, I'm leaving the pitch buildup that is on this saw blade from the ripping tests alone to act as a real world situation 
of what it would be like in a project when I'm switching from rip cutting to cross cutting. Because the idea behind these blades is I don't have to switch the blade. So I also shouldn't have to take the blade off and clean off the pitch between ripping with it and cross cutting with it. Here we have the cut in the Douglas fir. And if we look at it, there is some tear out. Basically all the way along, there's a fine bit of tear out. Nothing super deep. If I brush my finger across it, the little fuzzies come right off. And if I was to sand that a little bit, you'd never notice it. In terms of smoothness on the end of the cut, pretty smooth. It's definitely rougher than the dedicated crosscut blades, but not that much rougher. In terms of tear out, yes, there is definitely more tear out in the 70 tooth combination blade than either the 108 tooth or the 120 tooth cutoff blades. But I would still consider this to be acceptable. Here we have the pine. Again, very fine tear out. If I brush off the fuzzy bits with my fingers, you're left with just a little bit of tear out in here and in here that's below the surface, but Really, a little bit of light sanding, and that's going to go away. Here we have the inch thick cherry. Did a good job. It is definitely a little rougher than the dedicated crosscut blades, but not bad. Here we have the birch plywood. And right off the bat, I'm drawn to this thing right here. And there's a little bit of tear out there little bit here, a little bit there. From here to here, there is a fair amount of tear out, but it's not super deep. It is definitely more tear out on this thing than either the crosscut blades or the triple chip grind blade. So, so far, Smoothness wise, it's smooth at the end, but for the birch plywood at least, this definitely has the most tear out. Here's the three quarter inch thick cherry. And really, other than some very fine tear out right in here, if I brush away the fuzziness with my finger, I would have to really look to find that tear out. I'm not going to notice it unless I'm looking for it. And certainly, once I sand the thing, I'm never going to see it. Smoothness-wise, it does have, again, one little scratch right here. But other than that, I would say that is a very, very nice crosscut. In terms of crosscutting experience, the blade is extremely well behaved. It lets me control the cut. It's not trying to feed itself through the workpiece. But there is something I have always disliked on the red version of this and the non-red coated version of this exhibits the exact same thing and that is the sound it makes. I have never seen a saw blade or heard a saw blade make the annoying whining sound that this one does. And by this one, I mean this one in particular, plus the older red one I have. They all make this high pitch whine sound that is just obnoxious. And it's that perfect frequency that the earplugs don't completely take it out. 
it has to be something about the spacing of the teeth and the air going through it. It probably has something to do with the shape of this upper guard as well, or the diameter of the blade, and therefore the speed that the teeth are moving at, because I have this same blade in the 10 inch form on my DeWalt over there, and I have the same blade in its 8 inch form on the other DeWalt over there. They don't make this sound. Only the 14 inch blades on this thing seem to make this sound. So from a blade behavior standpoint, this is excellent in cross-cutting. From a, does it drive me slightly nuts every time I turn it on? That is an issue with this blade. So be aware, depending on the size blade you get, if it's one of these 70 tooth ones, it may make an obnoxious whining sound. Now we're going to try out the weird shaped Amana blade. And this blade, did a good job ripping and a good job raising the panel. So I have high hopes for it with cross cutting because if it can do a good job cross cutting, this is going to be an excellent general purpose blade. Just like the other two general purpose blades, I have left the pitch buildup on this thing from the ripping and panel raising tests once again, to simulate what it would really be like using this in a project where it's constantly switching back and forth from ripping to cross-cutting to ripping again. Here's the bottom of the cut on the Douglas fir done with the 40 tooth Amana general purpose blade and there's a lot of tear out. There's really no way to dress that up, that's just a lot of tear out. Yes, when I brush my fingers across it and remove the fuzzy bits, there's still a lot of tear out. It's not super deep and it's not super far back. So sanding it off wouldn't be a huge deal, but this is more tear out than any of the other blades during the cross cut test. And because this is the last blade I'm doing the cross cut test on, I can definitively say this is the worst amount of tear out on the Douglas fir out of any of them. The tear out on the pine is also excessive. Yeah, I can, some of it I can't even brush off. I have to pluck off of there. And again, if I was to sand that edge, it would come out easy enough, but it is more tear out than the other blades did. In terms of smoothness on the ends of the cuts, it doesn't have any teeth marks in these things except right there and that's pretty much where the other ones were happening too so i think there's a growth ring that kind of gives the blades fits right here but other than right there it is probably i would say the smoothest cut on the end of the three combination blades most amount of tear out but the end of the board is the smoothest Still doesn't compare to a dedicated cross-cut blade, but in terms of general purpose or combination blades, it's the best in terms of smoothness. And it should come as no surprise that it has the most amount of tear out on the birch veneer plywood. In terms of cross-cutting experience with this blade, I would say out of all the blades, this one was not as good as the rest. It was still fine, but you could tell it kind of wanted to feed the saw through the workpiece on its own. It never did. I was in control the whole time. It wasn't pushing against me, but I had the easiest time pulling it through the wood out of any of them. I could tell it was trying to help. 
which makes sense when you look at this thing. It has few teeth, there's only 40 in it. There's no little anti-kickback ears on it to limit how much of a bite it can take at a time. The only thing preventing this blade from propelling itself through the cut is the non-aggressive angle on the face of the teeth here. And it does it, it doesn't propel itself through, but it's definitely the one that came closest to that. Here we have the blades lined up from best at cross cutting to the worst at cross cutting. And once again, should come as no surprise that the two dedicated purpose blades beat out the general purpose ones. This was kind of a tough call to figure out whether the 108 tooth ultimate cutoff blade or the 120 tooth ultra fine finish blade came out on top. In terms of tear out, the ultra fine finish and the ultimate cutoff I could use either one of these and not be able to tell the difference in the end result. If you handed me the cut off boards from either one of these and asked me to identify which one it was, I really don't think I could tell you, honestly. The only thing that might tip me off is there was a little bit more roughness on the very end grain of the wood with the ultra fine finish blade versus the ultimate cutoff blade. So that might, I might be able to tell if I felt the end of the piece of wood, but if I was just looking at the tear out, I would have no idea which one it was. In terms of using the blade on the saw and what it was like to pull the saw through the material. If I was blindfolded, which I don't recommend you use any power tools blindfolded, but if I was blindfolded and I was asked to distinguish which one of these it was, I would not be able to tell you because in terms of feeding the blade through the piece of wood and not having it try to propel itself, they were identical. They were both excellent. If if the price of the blade is a factor in buying the blade, then this one wins hands down, because this is a super cheap blade. And to be honest, I am blown away by how good this thing cuts for being as cheap as it is. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. So there is that. If you're looking for a budget cross-cut blade, this is definitely the blade for you. In terms of general purpose or combination blades, it surprised me, but the best one for cross cutting was the Forest Woodworker One triple chip grind blade. In every wood except the Douglas fir, which I find interesting because the original wood I tried this on years ago and decided I didn't like it was Douglas fir and that seems to be the one type of wood this thing does not like. Other than the Douglas fir, it had a better or less tear out than either one of these, the Freud 70 tooth or the Amana 40 tooth combination blade. Second to this one, and it wasn't second by much, was the Freud Industrial 70 tooth. This one had more tear out in everything except the Douglas fir than the Forest Woodworker one, but not significantly more. They were both pretty close, but this one was a little cleaner. The Amana 40 tooth, that had a lot of tear out in everything I tried with it. It really is not good at cross cutting and I would say I'm not recommending this thing for cross cutting. 
So it was the worst. These are the best. These two do what you would expect a combination blade to do. They did an okay job cross-cutting, but not as good as the specific ones.